welcome to Thrive Church. We're so excited that you're here with us today. And uh, we're going to start off by just singing some songs to declare our freedom in God and who he is and his goodness. So we invite you to join us.
through difficult times, all we can do is focus on those hard times, right? It can be all consuming that that's all we think about, that's all we're meditating about, that's all we can talk about. And when we start to do those things, what we're doing is we're looking at the wind and we're looking at the waves of our lives, just like Peter did when he was in the boat. That he would, as soon as the Lord called him out of the boat, he stepped out of the boat, but then he got afraid, so he started looking around and what happened? He started to sink. He started to be overcome by the things that were going on around him rather than keeping his eyes on Jesus. Guys, you gotta keep your eyes on Jesus no matter what you're facing. That sometimes it means we need to stop talking about the things that we're going through and start talking about how good God is because God is faithful in all things. In all seasons, he will bring us through. In all seasons, he will give us the joy and the courage and the strength to face whatever it is and overcome. Because let me tell you something, if Jesus is your savior, then victory is in your future. So let's sing this song, praise the name. And even if it's hard, the words are easy. Praise the name of the Lord our God. We will praise his name forever. And when we choose to praise, when we choose to lift his name on high and stop focusing on the things around us, then we'll begin to walk on water. So let's praise his name ever so greatly today.
We want to praise your name, Lord, with everything that's within us. We don't want to focus on the things that are going on around us, Lord. We want to keep our eyes on you. We want to keep praising you in all circumstances because you are always good. So, Father, in the times where it's difficult, help us in our unbelief. Help us to recognize that we serve an almighty, powerful God who controls the wind and the waves. Lord, that there is nothing that you can't do. And so many times we pray these small prayers of, God, bless this food or bless our travel. Not that you're not going to do those things, but you're like, come on, give me something good. Because when you spoke, life happened. When you spoke, the world came into existence. You said, let there be light, and there was light. You spoke us into existence. Just by one word, you gave us life. So God, I would ask that our faith would grow today. That we would recognize what you are capable of and take you at your word, that you've given us such a great gift of forgiveness, that that's an everyday miracle that we have that nothing and no one can take away from us, Father. So grow our faith here as we hear your word, that we would be doers of your word, that we would go out and we would live a life that reflects that we trust you, that we trust you in all things, that we keep our eyes on Jesus through all things, that we tell our circumstances how big our God is rather than just telling people about the pain that we face. Lord, give us joy. Give us joy as we move forward that we could be a light for all to see so that people will glorify you in heaven because of the way that we live here on earth. So bring heaven down. We want to see more of your glory, more of your goodness, Father. You have overwhelmed us with your love. So come and do it again. Let us not forget you as our first love. Let us constantly and endlessly be bringing you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Welcome to Thrive Church. We are so happy to have you here. Uh, whether you are in New Britain, Torrington, Terryville, or online, we welcome you to Thrive Church today. My name is Judah Thomas, and I'm the lead pastor here. And we are in a series uh, called Party Crashers. Party Crashers. And throughout this series, we've been taking a look at different parties or celebrations in the Bible that have gotten crashed and, and kind of the, what the outcome of that was. Now, maybe you've crashed a party before. I don't know. I know I've been involved with some party crashing a time or two in my past, but we're looking at ones in the Bible. Last week, we talked about a gathering where people were trying to see Jesus, and four friends brought their friend who was paralyzed to see Jesus. They couldn't get in, so they tore the roof off, literally lowered him down, and Jesus not only healed their friend, but he forgave his sins. These friends would stop at nothing to make sure their friend met Jesus. Today, we're going to be talking about a story uh, from Luke chapter 15. And all throughout Luke, we see this kind of repeating theme that there's hope for everyone, even the social outcast. Specifically, there is hope for the people who are poor, the people who are sick, the people who are corrupt, the people who have you know, a crazy past. In other words, people like you and me. In your notes, there is hope for you, and that is good news. Good news to know that there is hope for us. There's hope no matter what we've done, no matter what our past is like, there is hope. Has anybody here ever grown up 
Raise your hand if you're brave enough. Has anybody here ever grown up in the shadow of a favorite sibling or something along those lines? Okay, a couple of you guys put your hands up. You know, you, you grew up in, you know, there was a sibling who, who never could do wrong, or they were just smarter than everybody, great at sports, or maybe if it wasn't a sibling, Maybe it was a, a friend or somebody in your school. You know, and your parents would always kind of compare you. They're like, why can't you be more like, like them? They have it all together. The reality of it is that sometimes in those situations, we see the real person, right? It's like, like everyone's like, why can't you be more like them? But you see them like around back, you know, sneaking a cigarette or, or cheating on their, their test or causing trouble. And it kind of feel like maybe it's my job to, to knock them down a few notches. To, to, to tell on them, to, to, to expose them to the world. Well, that's kind of like what this story here that we're going to be looking at today. In fact, it, it, it's a common story that many people, if you've been in church, you've probably heard this story, the story of the prodigal son. Now, in this story, I might as well be clear that, that this is a parable. So this is an illustrative story that Jesus told to illustrate some points. It wasn't necessarily a true story, although it may have been, but as far as we know, it was just a, an illustrative story to demonstrate spiritual truth. So we're going to read this story and hopefully dig into it and look at some things that maybe we haven't looked at before. In Luke 15, verse 11, it begins. It says, to illustrate the point further, now Jesus had just told two other stories one about a lost sheep, and one about a lost coin. And he says, to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons, and the younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. And a few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money in wild living. Have you ever done any, no, don't raise your hand about wild living, okay? This son was the younger of two sons, right? There's two sons, the older one, the younger one. Now he goes and he asks for his share of the inheritance. Now, traditionally in the Jewish culture, the oldest son would get twice as much as what the next son in line would get. So the older son would have gotten twice as much. This means the younger son would have basically gotten a third of his father's estate. So it was about a third of that. Now the interesting thing about this story is, and sometimes we just kind of blow by this, is that normally in that era, as well as in our current era, you don't get an inheritance until what happens? Someone dies, right? So you don't get the inheritance from your dad until they die. And here the son is going up, and basically what he's saying is, Dad, I want my inheritance. Essentially what he's saying is, you know what, Dad? I wish you were dead. You know, and, and, and since you're not dead, can you just go ahead and give me the money so I don't have to wait for you to kick the bucket any longer? That's essentially what this younger son was saying. And the dad agrees. Like, this is unheard of. This is unheard of for the father to agree to this. Like, well, why didn't the father just say, you know what, get lost. There's no way I'm giving this to you. Besides, you know, your inheritance is tied up in land and livestock and all of these things, and, and you want just cash? Like, like, we can't do that. But the father agrees. How dare this son go and make, a, make a, 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 an ask like this? Well, maybe, maybe he wanted it for an investment. Maybe he was going to go and invest it in some very solid, secure investments like Bitcoin or something. Maybe, maybe that was his intent. No, that wasn't his intent. You know what he wanted? He was going, he wanted parties, he wanted hookers, he was living the high life. That's what he was doing. You don't believe me. Read your Bible from time to time. Come on. That's what he wanted. He, he's like, I just want my, the money. I'm just going to blow it. He moves. A couple days later, he packs up. He moves. Moves to a distant land. He's like, I don't even want dad looking over my back while I do this. So he goes, and he's just living the high life. And then guess what happens? You know, he's got all this surplus money, but he's got no income. So he runs out of money. He runs out. All of his friends, they scatter. People that he thought were the friends, well, they were just sticking around for the good time. And now the good time dried up. They're gone, too. He runs out of money, and then a famine hits the land. And he's got nothing to even to eat. So now he's got to do what he never thought he'd have to do, and that's get a job. He's got to go get a job. So he goes, and he gets a job. If you know the story, you know what he did. He went, and he got a job for a pig farmer, and, 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 he's, and he's feeding the pigs. 
You know, this is a horrible job for a Jewish boy. Pigs are unclean. Like, like that's, that's one thing that like the Jews would not associate with, with pigs or pig farming or anything to do with him. And yet he's taking the lowest of the low job and it doesn't even pay him enough to eat. So he starts getting tempted by the food that the pigs are eating. And you know what pigs eat? They eat literally anything. And he's like, you know what? Maybe I'll just steal some of their food. And then a thought hits his mind. You know what? Maybe, maybe I can go home. See, but it's important for us to realize, though, because sometimes we see this story, we're like, wow, he really hit rock bottom here. You know something, though? It's worth writing in your notes. In your notes, it says, you don't need to hit rock bottom to turn to Jesus. You know, some of us were just, like, determined to hit rock bottom. And you hit rock bottom, and then you kind of bounce back, and you're like, you know what? I think I can go lower in my life, you know? Maybe you know somebody like that. Like, every time they hit rock bottom, it just gets a little bit deeper, doesn't it? And here, he hit rock bottom, but you don't need to hit rock bottom. And he hits rock bottom, though. And he's like, maybe, maybe I could go home. You know what? Maybe I can go home. In fact, some people say this is one of the first times baseball is mentioned in the Bible, when the prodigal son made a home run. Um, Sorry, it's not Father's Day, I know. Um, So he makes a home run. He's going home. He's thinking, like, you know what? Maybe I could go home and get a job as a servant. Because at least the servant in my dad's household... At least they're well fed. And at least they got a roof over their head. Sure, they got to work hard, but they're cared for. They're not starving right now. Maybe, maybe I can go home and maybe my dad will give me a job. That's all he's expecting here. It says, picking up in verse 20 of Luke 15, it says, So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. I, this isn't really what I'm talking about, but I just love that verse there, right? I love that part because he says, and while he was where? He was a long way off. What does this imply to you? This implies dad is waiting and watching, right? He's watching. He's watching to see, like, like when is my son coming back home again? He says, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. You know, no good, self-respecting Jewish man would run anywhere, they figured that was a childish thing. It was below them. Somebody could run up to them if there was a danger, but they didn't want to run anywhere. And yet this father is humbling himself, and he just takes off running. He sees his son. He runs over there filled with love and compassion. He embraces him. He kisses him. And his son says to him, he's like, Dad, I got a speech ready for you. He says, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I've done some horrible things, and I used your money to do it. And I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. His father just ignores what he has to say. Verse 22. But his father says to the servants. Doesn't even address the son. Addresses the servants. He says, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Give him a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. This is very significant. He's like, I'm going to clothe you. Yeah, you don't smell very good right now. You don't look very good, but I'm going to put clothes on you. I'm going to put a ring on your finger. This wasn't just any ring. This is a signet ring that, that only members of the family would wear, and this is something they would use in commerce to buy and sell. It gave them all the rights and privileges of being a son. The father is saying, come, put your ring back on. Put your clothes back on. Talks to the servant again. says, and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. He's like, let's, let's have a party. You know that cow we were saving for the 4th of July? Kill it now. We are going to have a party. So he said, we're going to celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and is now returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began, and they're partying, and they're having music, and having this great, and it's just this beautiful story, isn't it? It's just beautiful. The father could have ignored him. The father could have been like, Man, after all you did to me, and now here's what you do. You come crawling back to me after all I did for you, after how you hurt me. And he could have sent him away. But, but the father not only accepted his son back, but he restored him to his rightful place as son and heir. You know, it would have been extremely generous for the father to give him a job as a servant. It would have been generous because after all he had went through, the father could have been like, you know what? I will give you a job. And that would have been a great, generous thing to do. But he didn't because it was, it, that was generous, but it was outrageous to accept him back as a son. And it's a beautiful story of forgiveness and of reconciliation. And this demonstrates to each and every one of us that God's grace, 
This is God's blessings that we don't deserve and how that is freely available to anyone who turns to him, regardless of our past. See, in this story, the father is representative of God and how no matter how far we go, no matter what we do, he's always there waiting. He's eager for us to come back to accept us into his family again. And you notes, we all have the opportunity to find forgiveness and restoration in our Heavenly Father. And that's what this lost son, this runaway son, he found. He found forgiveness. He found restoration. It's a time for celebration. Let's throw a party. So they strike up the band, and there's this party, and they're, they're eating food, and they're having a good time, and they're celebrating. But this series isn't about parties. This series is called Party Crashers. So here's the crash. See, often the, the scripture, when we read it, it tells us who the audience was for the parables that Jesus tells. So it says Jesus tells a parable, and it'll say who he told it to. Like sometimes the parable was for like, like, like the, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the jacked up people. Sometimes the, the story was, was for his closest friends, his disciples. Sometimes the story was for them. This story had a specific audience but we got to back up to the beginning of the chapter to see who it was for luke 15 1 it says tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to jesus teach like we said i mean there was some messed up people that were coming they were all walks of life people who were looked down upon people who were rejects and outcasts people like you and me they would come to see jesus but that's not who the story was for it says Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people and even eating with them. They're like, look around, like, look at these people. Do you know what kind of past they had? You should be associating with the religious people, the good people. And so, so he's, and he's even eating with them. So Jesus told them the story. See, in your notes, the story was directed towards the religious people. This is to the people who had their act together. This is to the people who were smart and wise. These are for the people who, who were studying scripture, who, who had their act together, who, who everyone looked up to them. Now, of course, there's a little bit in the story for everybody. Mostly when we look at this story, we're like, wow, you know, it, it, it's for the reject. It's for the person who ran. Like, but the target audience here was the Pharisee. The target audience was the people who had their act together. See, the lost son is usually the focal point of this story, of this parable. The prodigal son, that's what it's called, the prodigal son. We all focus on the son who took everything, who ran away, who came back, and the father accepted him in, and we often overlook the emotions and the struggles of the older brother. So we're going to look at him right now, Luke 15, verse 25. Meanwhile, party's going. Meanwhile, the older son was where? Where was the older son? In the fields, working. He's out there. I've been working in the fields. Not railroad. <laughs> He's working on the fields, right? All the live long day. He's out there working in the fields. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants, what's going on? Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf, and we're celebrating because of his safe return. Verse 28, the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. So the older brother comes home. What was he doing all day? Working. He's out in the field. He's out there. He's, he's tending to the livestock. He, he's taking care of the crops. You know, he's out there sweating in the heat of the day. You know what he's doing out there working? He's pulling in the slack for his little brother who ran away. See, brother should have been out there too, right? Brother should have been out there helping. But no, no, brother's got to take a third of dad's money and just get out of town. And he does whatever he wants to do, but I'm here and I'm taking care of business and I'm gonna make sure we don't lose the place. I'm gonna make sure that we come back stronger than ever before. And he's pulling in the slack. And then he shows up to a party that he wasn't invited to. He didn't even know. He shows up and there's a party. What's the party going on? What's happening here? Now, usually in the story, we kind of look down on this brother. Like, man, yeah, you should have been celebrating with everybody. You should be happy for your brother. That's understandable. He was the good son. He did what he was told. 
right? Like dad would say, hey, go and take care of the flocks. Go and do this and that. And he did what he was told. He was the, the most likely to succeed. He was the one who would soon inherit everything that was his father's. He, he was the responsible one. And he was the one who worked quietly while his father grieved the loss of his son. Yeah, dad's out there waiting for his son to come home. Well, guess what? I'm going to be out in the fields making sure we don't lose anything. I'm going to make sure that, that we still have food on the table. I'm going to make sure that, that we have what we need. He did what had to be done. He carried the weight and then some. And honestly, if we look at ourselves, we all have this tendency to be jealous sometimes. Maybe, maybe it looks more like this. I've been following God for a long period of time. But why is he blessing that person and not me? Well, why is that person experiencing something in their life that, that I want to experience, but I'm not experiencing it myself? You know, this is something that, that I deal with all the time. And I don't know why. It's my personality. It's how I'm wired. Whatever, whatever I do, I'm like, i got to be the, the best at it. When I started learning how to play guitar, if somebody could play guitar better than me, I'd be like jealous. Like, i got to be a better guitarist than them. Or i got to be a better this. Or i got to be a better this. And, and, you know, we start the church. And, and I start saying, oh, well, how come this person's church is, is growing faster than ours? And, oh, how come this person was able to do this thing that I wanted to do? And, and it's very easy to fall into this trap of jealousy. Very easy Say, well, God, why are you blessing that person? In your notes, it's easy to become jealous of God's blessings to others. They haven't served as long as I have. They haven't put in the time like I have. They haven't been following Jesus and doing the hard things as long as I have. Well, continuing on here, Luke 15, 29. So the father comes, he's begging him, come in to the party, come in. The older son replies, all these years I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never even gave me a little goat for a feast with my friends. You never gave me nothing. And I'm out here working, and, and you never give me a goat. And yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, on whores, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf? Come on. That's interesting. I was more concerned about a goat than he is about his own brother coming home. It's like, oh, you never gave me a goat. You never gave... See, the older brother feels entitled, right? He's like, he's, I'm entitled. He's angry and not rejoicing at the return of his, his brother because he feels like it's an injustice. It's not fair. I've been here doing the hard work, and, and now he gets to, to, to reap the rewards. What are the root causes of jealousy in this situation? Well, one is possibly an insecurity. But, but also, you know what else it is? It's this comparison. We start comparing ourselves amongst ourselves. Well, but I've done this, and I've done that, and, and how come God's not blessing me, and how come Dad's not blessing me, and, and how come they get this when I've done all of this stuff? You know what happens? And you know, it's we always lose the comparison game. Whenever you start playing the comparison game, well, this person has that, and oh, man, I really want to get that. How, oh, God, why did you let them get that? How could you let that happen to them and not happen? Why did you bless them that? We always lose. In fact, we see now he's calling himself a slave rather than, rather than a son. I've slaved for you, putting himself lower than a servant. For some reason, he thought that, that working extra hard would, should earn more favor with his father. Since I've worked so hard, you should love me more. And yet, sometimes that's how we feel too. Because I've served God more, I deserve more. It's like God owes me something. Like, God, you owe me this. After all I've done, you owe me. You know, in your notes, God doesn't owe us anything, but he gives us mercy and grace. See, that's the thing. He doesn't owe us. He doesn't owe us. But he gives us freely. He gives us mercy. He gives us grace. Do we ever find ourselves jealous of people who are being blessed? Do we find ourselves jealous of people who are being forgiven, somebody just comes to faith in Christ and it's like, it seems like God is just blessing them. They're coming to God and it's like, you know, they're, they're, they're getting healed and you're like, but, but I've been praying for years to be healed. How does this person come? And two weeks later they get healed. The very same thing I'm struggling with. How does that happen? God, how could you let this happen? See, this older brother, this jealous brother couldn't celebrate the blessings in someone else's life. What's he jealous of? What was he really jealous of? The trail of destruction that his brother left behind him? How his brother blew all this money and drove his life into the ground? Or is he jealous of the attention? 
and jealous of the, the affection and jealous of the, the maybe the little blessing that comes when he returns home. See, many of us, we find it easy to relate to this younger son. Lived our life wild living. We hit the rock bottom. We return home and we're loved and accepted. We, we love this story because we really relate to that. But you know, it's easy for us to go from being one brother to the other brother. That after, after we've been in it for a while, we start to kind of gravitate towards the, the older brother a little bit. Maybe we need to relate to the older brother a little bit more. Do we ever look at, look at people with contempt? Are there areas in our life where, where jealousy and resentment have crept in? Do we relate more with the rebellious son or the religious son? The son who's like, well, I've got my act together and you never did anything for me. See, the true mark of a Christian is to be able to celebrate a blessing in someone else's life when it's the very blessing that you want to see in your life. I don't know if you caught that. To be able to celebrate the blessing in someone else's life that you want to see in your life. How can we celebrate when somebody has a baby when we've been barren all of our life? How do we celebrate somebody getting a job and a promotion when I just got laid off? How do we celebrate someone being healed when I'm still here battling day in and day out? How do we celebrate somebody getting married when I'm still here single with no prospects? Can I celebrate the blessing in somebody else's life even when it's the very thing that I've been praying for in my own life? Continuing on here, verse 25. His father said to him, look, dear son, You've always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life, and he was lost, but now he's found. See, the older brother was faithful to the father, but he became bitter towards his brother. Sometimes we fall into that same trap. Maybe we're being faithful to our our heavenly father, we're faithful to God, but we become bitter towards other people in our life. See, the sin of the older brother was jealousy and bitterness. And we shouldn't let our obedience to God and our faithfulness to God allow us to become cold-hearted and bitter. And this is the unfortunate state of a lot of people who call themselves followers of Christ is that we're not loving anymore. We're cold-hearted and bitter. And we're frustrated that somebody else is getting a blessing that we're not getting in our life. As if God somehow deserves or somehow owes me a breakthrough. As if God somehow owes me something. No, 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 no. He doesn't owe us anything. But you know what I, I think is really cool about this story? Is the same dad who ran to the younger brother also came out to the older brother. Never noticed that before. Like he pursued them both. He saw the younger brother come and he ran out to meet him. But then the other brother, he heard he was angry wasn't, and he goes out to meet him too. And see, God is just like that. He's going to meet you wherever you are. And he's going to come, and he's going to love you, and he's going to accept you, and he's going to offer you mercy and grace. And see, so the story doesn't end with a jealous brother. See, the father extends the same love and the same grace to the older brother as well. And you cannot earn God's love. You cannot earn God's grace. This is something that is given freely to each and every one of us who call on the name of God. And that older brother, yes, he was jealous and bitter, but the father still came to him. He said, why don't you come in and celebrate? We don't exactly know how the story ends here, but how does the story end for you? Do we put aside the selfish ambition? Do we put aside the jealousy, the bitterness, the anger towards somebody else? Do do we put aside all these things? Do we choose to forgive somebody for the hurt they've caused us? Do we choose to, to, to let something slide for the sake of building a relationship? Do we let it slide Or we say, you know, I'm going to stay and I'm going to wallow in my bitterness. See, Jesus was telling this to the people who had their act all together. The people who were looking down at the jacked up of the world. Saying, how could Jesus associate with them? Which side do we fall into? And let me tell you, the Father is pursuing you both. He's pursuing you. If you're far from God, if you've ran away, man, he is waiting for you to come back with open arms. And if you've been sitting on the sidelines with a scowl on your face saying, I don't see how God could love them. I don't see how God could save this person. I don't see how God could use this person. Man, they they vote differently than I do. They look differently than I do. How could God use that person? He is the same loving Father. And we can come to this Father and receive the mercy the grace, the help, the forgiveness, and the provision when we need it. And it's only through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
So God, we come to you now. And we thank you that you are a good God, that you don't show favorites, that you love us, and there's nothing that can separate us from your love, neither life nor death, nor heaven nor hell, nor demons nor angels. Nothing can separate us from your love. Help us to understand, to fully grasp how wide, how deep your love is for us, Lord. And we thank you that just as you accept prodigals with open arms, you also accept the ones of those that have been kicking around for a while. And maybe we've gotten a little jaded and a little frustrated. If you're here today and your life is not right with God, don't let another day go by. God's word says if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you say with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord, that you'll be saved. Won't you call on his name today? Won't you call on his name and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. When that happens, it's like the prodigal. It's like this lost son coming home. And guess what? Dad's not ticked off. Dad is waiting. He's running out to see you, to bring you in, to put the clothes on your back, to put the ring on your finger, to have a celebration. There's a celebration when any of us return home like that. And maybe, maybe you're more like the older son right now. You need to confess some bitterness, some anger, some jealousy, some resentment. So God, we just come to you now and we give all these things to you. We know that you are a good God. You are a God who forgives, a God who restores, and a God who loves us equally. We're sorry that sometimes we try to earn your love. Sometimes we think that we're deserving of it because of the things that we've done, and we realize that we're nothing without you, that it's only by your unmerited kindness, your unmerited grace and mercy that we can be made right with you. So we call on your name now. We say that you are our Lord. We thank you for saving a wretch like me, that we thank you that even though we were lost, we are now found. Even though we are dead, we are now alive through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we ask you, Lord, to have your way in us. Help us to love people that nobody else loves. Let us stand up and make a difference for you and for your kingdom. We thank you. We praise you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.
I'm always so blown away by these parables. Like, think about the task that's laid before Jesus here, right? It's like, make a story, okay? Now make this story relevant to every single person in the world. Also make it span a couple thousand years and still be relevant and be applicable at different parts of our lives at different times. Think of the, the wisdom that's in these parables, that's in Jesus' words. To be able to craft something like that is just uncomprehensible. We think about our own lives and how these, uh, these two brothers represent us at different stages in our life. When we're in sin, how we address the father. So the younger son, he's living a life of sin. No question about it. Everyone can see it plain as day. And he approaches the, the father in humility. And then we, we get saved. We thank Jesus for all that he did. And then we start to become self-righteous because of how much our behavior has changed from when we were in that sinful lifestyle. And how we, we come to the Father and we say, look at all I've done for you. And it's at those times we need to go back to that point in our life and, and think back to when we were sinners. What does God owe me? If we're being honest, what does God owe me? Death, the punishment for sin. The only thing that God has ever owed me is death. And the fact that he was waiting for me to come back, he was looking for me far away to come meet me. Wherever I was, covered in, in filth, eating slop. So wherever you are in your life, I want to challenge you to to think about that moment, whether it's today, whether it was 10 years ago, that moment when you realized that Jesus had to die for your sins so that you could even think of approaching the Father. Not out of a self-righteousness of how far we've come since that moment, but remembering back to the beginning where God made the decision to change everything. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks so much for being here.